Recent statistics indicate that there are over 1.6 million active lawyers across North America. This is a very competitive industry when it comes to professional services. Now, as a business development consultant for professionals, I've worked with hundreds of lawyers to help them raise their profile and drive new revenues. The commonalities I see among successful lawyers include doing great legal work for their clients, a willingness to try new methods to grow their practice, and always being consistent when it comes to client communications and managing expectations. Now, it's easier said than done, but this is pretty much the formula I've seen work over and over again. Hey there, I'm Chris and welcome to This Professional Life, a channel where I share my insights, strategies, and ideas around business development, as well as documenting interesting business stories that inspire my creativity. Now, during my time as a business development manager at a global law firm, I had the opportunity to chat with many articling students who were just getting ready to enter the profession. Some common questions I would get include how best to develop their careers, do I stay in private practice or look to transition to in-house role at a large company, and how do I build a network to grow my book of business? Now, there are no straight answers as everyone's situation is different, but there's always things you can learn from from successful lawyers who are currently active in the space. Leah Tolton, partner at Bennett Jones LLP, a large national law firm here in Canada, is a successful corporate lawyer with a very unique practice that focuses on family operated businesses. I wanted to invite Leah on my podcast, not only to learn about how she built a successful law career, but also how professionals in general build successful practices in whatever industry they're in. And with that, I've also had a lot of conversations with young professionals breaking into their professional careers. And I find it fascinating that for a lot of successful professionals, the path wasn't very straightforward and oftentimes didn't start out in that professional career that they are now in. What's interesting is that Heather Barnhouse, another successful lawyer I interviewed last season, had a similar experience entering the legal profession. It wasn't as direct and straightforward, and one seemingly unrelated path would take them on a journey into law. Um, I have a little bit of an untraditional path that I followed to get to you know, the, the spot that I'm at right now. I actually grew up in rural Manitoba. Okay. I was a farm girl way back in the day. And so, you know, I uh, attended at, attended school at local schools and at the local high school. And, you know, when I was making career decisions back in the day, I won't tell you what day that was. Um, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of role models available to kind of give you some idea about what certain career paths might look like. So I knew my career path was going to go through university, but I just didn't really know which way. Right. So I selected a a academic path that would allow me to complete two degrees in five years, which probably should have been a clue that I was looking for some academic challenge, but you know, I was 17 at the time, what did I know? So I started that uh, path and then decided at the end of my first year of university that you know, that really wasn't the path for me. And so I finished the degree I started, which was a degree in human ecology okay. with a major in family studies. Was there a tie to like your farming background? Well, kind of, sort of, but yeah. not really. Okay. Um, you know, one of the role models I had back in the farming background was that uh, uh, I was a longtime um, member of an organization called 4-H, which is an organization for rural youth okay. where they uh, engage in leadership opportunities and they do project work. And the role model I had there was the person who came to judge the project work. And that person had a background in human ecology. Oh, okay. So I thought that looked kind of interesting. It was something I liked, yeah. something I'd enjoyed. Maybe that was a career path I'd pursue. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got there in the first place, because that was one of the role <laughs> models I had. Uh, and so I finished with that designation and, or with that degree rather. And, you know, that's really what set me up on my path for the early stages of my career. So at what point did you want to switch <laughs> or... <laughs> How did law come into the oh, picture really here? Oh, really good question. Really good question. So, you know, after I finished that degree, I spent a few years in human services. And I, my, my major roles were as um, an employment support or an employment counselor to vulnerable people. So I worked with people who had multiple handicaps for a while. I worked with people who uh, were recipients of social allowance for a while. And in that context, 
I was charged with doing some career planning for them, right. for people who were looking for a way to get into the job market. So I engaged in the uh, career assessment tools that we were able to use with those folks. And it was then that the information came out that really I should be in business or in law. Okay. So that's how I got there. So I had finished a degree. Yep. I had been working for several years and then went through this unrelated career uh, assessment process. And, you know, this was an area identified for me as an area that I should pursue. Was there anything in your, I guess, in your youth that would have said that law would be in the picture? Or was it after this kind of initial job? Well, it depends on who you ask. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't really in my contemplation. But now, you know, people who worked with me then or who knew me then or who went to school with me then said, this was obvious. Right. Like, what took you so long? <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> you, gotcha. the, you know, this is something that we could easily have seen you doing. You yeah. know, I was, yeah. I was involved in debate. You know, I was involved in all kind of leadership roles and all kinds of that kind of, of that kind of endeavor while yeah. I was, you know, a youth. And so people who watched me saw it before I did. Yeah. Is there anything in the legal profession itself specifically that attracts you to it? Well, you know, the thing that's been really appealing to me, you know, throughout my career is the level of intellectual challenge. You know, back to that comment I made about, you know, finishing two degrees in five years. Yeah. You know, that's really, I think, been one of the most important reasons that I have um, uh, pursued and continued with a career in law. Uh, and that that has never changed. Um, the, the complexity of the problems that I get to apply my mind to are also really appealing. Mm. It is never boring. It is never the same from day to day. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that's, that's what I have obtained as a result of pursuing that course of study and engaging in that career. Yeah. Now, you are currently a partner at Bennett Jones, mm -hmm. uh, the national Canadian law firm. Yep. Although Bennett Jones does have offices in the U.S., I believe. No, it does not. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. No, it's a Canadian law firm. Canadian law firm. Um, now, you and I met before in a mm -hmm. previous firm, mm -hmm. um, but talk a little bit about how you got to where you're at now, just from a career standpoint. Walk me through kind of once you got your law degree, what did that path look like to, to now? Okay, well, <laughs> that's also not very traditional. Uh, it had a few bends and curves in the road along the way. Um, I started, uh, I articled at a firm that had 16 lawyers at the time, uh, and they acted for a lot of owner-managed businesses. And... I had terrific articles there, but I came out in a recession 30 okay. years ago. And at the time, it was very challenging to be you know, kept on at your firm after you had invested all of this training time. And so my firm decided for me that um, they had a place for me in the business law group. Okay. And I thought when I went through law school, I'd be a litigator because that's what I had seen on TV. So again, those were my role models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? I thought I was going to be a courtroom lawyer. But, you know, economic reality is what it is. And I like to eat. And so <laughs> I, of course, accepted this role. And um, it was a terrific decision. It was right. just a terrific decision. Back to that assessment that, you know, pointed me in the direction of business and law. Mm -hmm. You know, taking on a role in the business law group was actually perfect. Right. So I had a lot of experience there with owner-managed businesses. And from there, I moved to a different firm where I uh, gained some really high level real estate experience. Uh, and it, I followed someone who left that firm to um, my previous firm where I had a corporate commercial practice throughout, which had flavors of real estate and also financing to it. Right. And throughout that period of time, um, I engaged in advising a lot of companies that had really started from very little. You know, the metaphor that I use is that particularly in Edmonton, you, there are a lot of businesses here who have started with limited resources, like $50 and a half ton truck, mm. and they have really built something significant out of that. Right. And so throughout that period of time, those have been the people I've gravitated to. Yeah. And many of those companies by nature are family owned. Mm. And so, you know, I got to the stage of my career that I'm at now and realized, you know, really that's the commonality here right. that underpins all of the, the corporate clients that I work with. Mm -hmm. You know, so it took me a long time 
to tie together that family studies and that business and that law right. to get to the stage where, you know, really this has all come together in this environment and this is how it looks now. It's not that easy, right? Like I think today's, uh, I'm going to age myself too, but <laughs> I think today's youth are, and maybe this is the effect of social media and seeing, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not always true, but you see that instant success, instant, oh, okay. like, I know what I want to do. And this is, I decide to take the leap. And yeah. a year later, here I am driving my Lambo and I'm, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think so many kids don't realize that that's one in a million people that that would ever happen. And a lot of times it's faked on social media. I was just going to say, and a lot of times you don't even know that the person who's portraying that image really yeah. has any of the substance behind it. That's absolute right. And so this idea of like building your career, finding out, you know, your purpose and your focus and what you really enjoy doing over, you know, a much longer period, I think. You can say decades. I'm not saying that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's yeah. I think it's lost on a lot of the youth like it's I think it's tough for them not to have that instant gratification of yeah I got my perfect career yeah and overnight I, I agree and I think that a lot of young people who are you know at the stage where they're needing to make career decisions on their own really feel like they have to get it right yeah. you know because of that you know that image has been portrayed to them that there's this perfect result that can be obtained really easily and so they want to make sure that they make the right decision now so they have that perfect result right now yeah and yeah you know my experience demonstrates that you know you'll make a decision now that serves you for now and maybe for a few years and then you have to make another one yeah and then you make a different decision it takes you off in a different direction and then you do it again mm -hmm. right so you know, the path is really not as linear as I think social media convinces youth that it yeah. is today. Yeah. Um, you've stayed in corporate law firms throughout your career. Was there ever a point in time where you thought maybe I should start my own practice on my own? No, okay. there wasn't. Um, you know, what I've really valued, you know, to your earlier question about um, the legal profession is the ability not only to work on that really intellectually stimulating work and complicated problems, but to have teams to help me out with that. You know, I haven't had to know it all. Mm. I've been able to draw on some really strong, really skilled colleagues to provide service to my clients. And so the thing that I've really valued about being in the firm environment is that you know, I'm surrounded by people, quite frankly, who are smarter than me. Right. They're more skilled than me. They're, they have more uh, specialized expertise than me and really I've become the quarterback and I introduce those folks when I need to right. but you know, having those people available to me has just been invaluable so you know from my perspective I do better in an, in a group environment right but it's all it, although some firms do I would say take that more entrepreneurial pr mm -hmm. pr approach for their partners for sure like from a business development sure. initiative I know you do a lot of your mm -hmm. own things mm -hmm. you know you're the one taking care of the client it's not mm -hmm. like I mean, you have that support, as you say, yeah. but it is almost like running your own little practice within a, For sure. a large umbrella. For sure. And there's a lot of of um, you know business principles that you need to understand in order to have a successful practice. You know, and you know back to that first experience I described in the firm at which I articled. One of the most valuable experiences I got in my entire career there was. Um, the situation where I I inherited a practice from a person who left on a leave and, and did not return. Right. And so, and that was a divorce practice. Oh. And so <laughs> I inherited a divorce practice when I was a, I was a brand new lawyer. And so I had to figure out pretty quickly uh, how to screen clients, mm. uh, how to get retained, um, how to describe the service I was going to provide, uh, how to deliver that service and report, how to get paid, and how to do it again. And that's really what you're talking about, about the entrepreneurial yeah. pieces, you know, and running a business. And so that experience was invaluable in understanding how the business of law works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the nuts and bolts about how the money comes in and out. Yeah. And then you add on the advice pieces, which are the value that you're selling to get paid. Right. Um, even in a large law firm, mm -hmm. as you and I know, <laughs> Because I've been in the business development role there. Mm -hmm. 
there's still a need for partners to go out and hunt for business. For sure. It's not about just because you're at Bennett Jones, mm -hmm. the phone's going to ring. I'm going to sit there and be super busy. Mm -hmm. So what kind of advice can you give for you know younger lawyers coming into the profession in understanding that there is still that aspect uh, that they need to build their practice and it's not maybe as straightforward as I'll join a big firm and the phone's going to be ringing off the hook and then everybody's going to be happy <laughs> and I'm going to have lots of files to work on. Yeah, like, you know, there's an element of that for sure for people who are coming out early in their careers and there, there should be an expectation that they're not going to start having to generate their own business. For sure. But, but you know, really, you know, I think the advice that I would give people in that position is that... Um, in order to fulfill that expectation that will be placed on you at some point in the future, you need to be developing relationships now. Right. And those relationships aren't just with clients or prospective clients. They're with people that you'll work with on files. They'll be internal lawyers, like I've referred to. Mm -hmm. you, know, you need to have good relationships with those folks. You have to have good relationships with the people who are delegating work to you now because they'll be work referral sources into the future. You need to develop relationships with other kind of professionals yeah. who you will work with on files. So, you know, in my world, I work with bankers all the time. I work with accountants all the time. I work with people who provide tax advice all the time and insurance advisors and wealth advisors. I work with all those people a lot. Yeah. And so it's really important for me to have relationships with those people. Um, some of them I work with more often than others. And so I have really deep relationships with them. But you know, really, that's the investment I think that a junior person needs to make at the early stage of their career is in the relationships with the people that they want to work with in the future over and above their clients. Yeah. Well, and that's long term, right? Because yeah. I would say your relationships with those key bankers, mm -hmm. again, it's not like it's the last couple of years. No. You've been building that for that's right. decades. <laughs> decades. You can say <laughs> there it. There you go. Yes, you can say it. So, yeah, that's right. And, you know, um, it can be difficult as a junior person starting out in a career to see the importance of attending this networking event or this dinner or this lunch or whatever. It can be mm -hmm. difficult to understand why that's important right now when you've got really pressing other obligations. That you need Fair to. enough. But the reason it's important right now is that each of those incremental touch points builds a relationship. Yeah. And over time, those relationships are what assist you to build a practice when the time comes that that's your responsibility yeah one of the initiatives that i uh did in that in our previous firm is to it was called like the young professionals networking mm -hmm. event and it was the whole idea mm -hmm. was to invite the young associates mm -hmm. out to this networking event and then i would go out and hunt for some younger mm -hmm. account managers at banks and stuff that were just getting into their career mm -hmm. and if you could lock those relations uh, relationships down early then, you know, five, six years down the road, you're both exactly promoting correct. and elevating in your careers. Exactly. Correct. And sooner or later, they become decision makers. And now you've got that relationship. Absolutely right? right. And, you know, that also applies, you know, with people that you work with and with your classmates. You know, in law school, we go through with a group of, of people that we identify with pretty closely because we've spent our three years in law school with them. But, you know, those people are also going to move out that career. Yeah. Some of them are going to end up in house. Some of them are going to go into business. Some of them are going to go into government. Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be in finance, yeah. right? They're not all going to be in private practice, you know? So those relationships are important to maintain as well. Yeah. Well, and a lot of the relationships with the big companies is with their internal general counsel. Correct. So hundred percent. Um, so on that, I want to talk a bit about your FEA designation. Mm -hmm. Because there's a component to lifelong learning, I think, for every professional, mm -hmm. uh, that it's important that you continue learning new things, keep an open mind, and yeah. and uh, better yourself within your professional career. So talk a little bit about what, well, first of all, what FEA stands for, and why you felt it was important to get the FEA designation for yourself. So an FEA is an acronym for a Family Enterprise Advisor. And a family enterprise advisor has obtained uh, a designation for a combination of reasons. First of all, they need to be a senior practitioner in their area of endeavor, and it could be law or it could be finance or it could be wealth management or accounting or any other number of things. Okay. So they need to be pretty skilled and experienced in their own sphere. And in addition, they 
uh, pursue this course of study that provides them with a bigger picture in terms of how issues that arise in a family overlap with issues that arise in an ownership group and overlap with issues in a business that may be owned or um, operated by the family. Okay. And you know anyone who's been in that kind of situation understands how those things all tangle together and how hard it is to pull that stuff apart. And what, it, what an FEA does is they apply their own expertise together with their understanding of this bigger picture to deal with those really complicated emotional problems mm-hmm. that I've been talking about in my earlier comments. Right. And it's, uh, I have to say, family-run businesses, to your point, mm-hmm. is... I mean, running a business is difficult as is, uh, yeah. <laughs> but with the family component. Oh, for sure. And I've heard you speak a lot about this on your podcast is mm-hmm. that there's a lot of family dynamics that come totally. into play, relationships, communication mm-hmm. or lack of communication mm-hmm. um, and having those conversations. Uh, and you may not be able to share <laughs> a lot of your, as I know, in the legal yeah. world, a lot of it is private client, but yeah. are there any interesting kind of family business files that you've been able to experience or work on that, that stands out for you? You know, I, you know, I could give an example that I think will resonate with people of um, a situation where a person who owned a family business had sold it. Um, and the buyer had mismanaged it and had not dealt with the employees well. And it, it did, it, it actually ended up in receivership. It was cool. Oh. And so this owner who had watched his baby go to this new buyer and be mismanaged and the people that he valued so much be not treated the way he had hoped, okay. bought it back. Oh, okay. And the thing that really struck me at that time and that's really that re- resonated with me and has stuck with me is um his comment to me at the time that we finished that buyback because you know his family's now back in control he can now mm. treat the thing and the people in it the way he wanted as i was escorting him out he took my hand at the elevator and he shook it and he said i want to congratulate you you saved 70 jobs today wow and i thought wow i never really thought about it that way you know, me doing my thing with my contracts and my negotiations yeah, and yeah. the diligence and stuff like that. Like it was all very technical, but that made it human. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, realizing that all these technical things we do have real human implications, mm-hmm. you know, is really, you know, something that I, I've i I've really um, come to appreciate and value in my practice, you know, and to bring you back to that comment about the FEA and why mm-hmm. I would pursue it. You know, I'm now at the stage where, you know, I deal with those kinds of problems regularly. And so I thought that that designation would allow me to add even more value and more understanding of exactly how to pull those emotional things apart. Mm -hmm. Um, Aside from some of these client uh, Mm -hmm. files that you work with or work on, in a large law firm, what are some of the challenges uh, for lawyers navigating uh, the area of corporate law, private practice? Uh, some of the challenges, I think, um, there are a few. Uh, you know, it can be really hard as a young person, both to, a young co- professional, I'll say, mm-hmm. um, to figure out how to balance both the technical things and the work product that you're expected to generate and, you know, the other production expectations you have with, um, professional development and business development and your life, Mm -hmm. you know, so figuring out how to make all those things work together is an ongoing challenge. Right. Um, you know, the, the coming to the point where you realize that this process is an investment in a career as opposed to an investment in a job is something important. So, you know, to, the comment we've made about this taking decades, Mm -hmm. you know, what I say to people who are, you know, struggling with corporate law and how hard it can be to get established and how hard it can be to manage all these things. You know, I remind them, this is a 40 year career, right? 40 years, right? You're going to be working at something for that long. So here's where we are right now. These are the facts we are trying to balance right now. And, you know, that we'll deal with right now, but you're not going to be here for 40 years. Yeah your life is going to change and you'll have to make another decision right at some point in the future. So it's hard for people 
to see that, you know, this, this requires a long-term investment and this is a long game. Mm -hmm. It's not an immediate situation where everything is resolved. If I do this over and over again, I have achieved success. Yeah. That's not the way it works. You really have to be persistent, incremental investments to get that result. In your opinion, is, is this idea of long-term building long-term, you know, is it just for lawyers? No. You think it's other not. it's applicable for other professions? I think so. Absolutely. I, you know, and really for business people, mm -hmm. you know, like I think this is, you know, this is something that I think is probably a transition that most people have to struggle with as they, they reach some level of, you know, achievement and skill or ability. And they think, oh, I, or they've had in their mind that once they get there, oh, I've got made in the shade. It's all yeah. good. No, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not how it works. That helps a lot. Right. It's a great step along the way, but no, I think that this is, I, I don't think that this struggle is unique to people in the legal profession. If you could go back and give advice to your younger self uh, when you were just starting out, uh, what would it be in relation to your career as a lawyer? Uh, it would probably be uh, to be more comfortable with uncertainty mm. and to be prepared to adapt to change. You know, this is not unrelated to the comment we've been making about thinking you have to make the right decision yep. and you've got it set for all time. You know, probably won't surprise you since you've worked with me before, but I tend to be a bit of a control freak. <laughs> and, you know, that really isn't always functional behavior, but it's the thing that kind of, you. some people use to manage that anxiety and that discomfort with uncertainty. Yeah. And that uncertainty or that, you know, the need to exercise judgment about decisions never really goes away. Mm. You never really are sure that this is perfect. This is the thing. You you need to be prepared to to see that maybe it didn't work out the way you wanted or as fast as you wanted or right. you need to change course some way and you need to adapt. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I think I would tell my younger self. Okay. Um, and also to trust that... You know, I had enough innate ability to be able to do something a lot bigger than I expected. Mm. You know, like, you know, coming from the background I did and with, you know, with the guidance that was available at the time, you know, and, and from the time period, you know, we are talking decades ago, <laughs> you know, like it's at the that 2000s, you could keep going, you could keep rewinding, <laughs> um, you know, so at that, in you know, in that time and place, you know, there was just a whole different set of expectations that were available to people making decisions, never mind young women making decisions. Mm. And so, um, you know, I, I think I would tell my younger self to trust that, you know, you've got a lot that you can work with here. Mm -hmm. It may not be obvious how it will all come together, you know, back to uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it may not be, you may not make the perfect decision the right time, but you'll figure some things out adaptation mm -hmm. and um yeah i think that's what i'd say yeah uh one thing that i didn't that i wanted to ask you before uh especially in private practice in a mm -hmm. big firm you deal with a lot of high profile clients mm -hmm. uh, some fairly large clients as well mm -hmm. what are what's some advice you can provide younger professionals who are starting to you know get ready to work on these files what are your top i guess tips about managing those relationships and keeping those relationships because oftentimes i would say larger files higher profile clients could be a little harder to manage or need a little bit more attention maybe mm -hmm. um what are what's some advice you got uh for other professionals that are managing these larger files well it's sometimes true that those things are harder to manage but really you know the basics are the same you know like people like to be treated the way you would like to be treated. Mm. You know, if you've committed to something on time, be on time. Yeah. Um, if something is going to be complicated, explain that. You know, take the time necessary to to make that clear. You know, if there's going to be some barrier or roadblock or some expense that comes up, just tell them. Like and and treat them you know, what I say to people, and what I've said to clients also is, you know, I I, I like to think that you know, I manage your matter mm -hmm. as though it was my own. 
how would I like to see this go? How, when would I like to hear from someone? Right. You know, what would I like to see done? Why? I don't want to have to do any thinking mm-hmm. if I'm paying a person to do this. I'd like them not to waste my money. You know, <laughs> I'd like to try to be yeah. efficient, right? Mm-hmm. I'd like them to think about that without me having to complain about it. Mm. You know, so, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Right. Chances are they're a lot like you, regardless of whether they're running a small business or a big business. You know, right. people aren't fundamentally different. And, you know, also show some genuine interest in, you know, what's going on with them. Like, how did they get here? You know, right. what what are they trying to accomplish here? You know, the stories that I hear from people, uh, particularly when when we're in a situation when, we, when we're selling that business they started with 50 bucks and a half ton truck. Yep. And some of those people are the big businesses you're talking about. You know, then the stories come out about what they had to do to get there, uh-huh. right? And they're fascinating. Like, yeah, you know, the the time they were out in the dark in the middle of nowhere, and they they got lost, or it was snowing like crazy, or, or you know, they they uh, had used the last room on their visa to buy the last inventory they had, and they didn't know what they were right. going to do next, and it turned around, or they sent their wife out to some place that was remote. And she had to figure out, you know, where this is going to be delivered and on and on. Like, the stuff is fascinating, what yeah. these people had to do. And if you can find that stuff out, suddenly it's a whole lot less intimidating. It's not really that different from your own experience and the way you would expect things to unfold or be treated. Yeah. You know, yeah. So that helps a lot if you can great advice. see them as humans because they are. Yeah. Um, the legal profession is mm-hmm. always changing. It is, uh, <laughs> you almost hear about new cases, new decisions, uh, almost daily. Um, I would say, especially in the corporate world, how do you stay on top of things? Cause you run a very busy practice mm-hmm. and I hear this a lot. When do you have time <laughs> to learn new things, but you've done your FEA designation and that was not easy no. that you needed to commit a lot of hours to that. No. Um, what are some best practices to stay up to speed? Well, you know, this is one of the things I value about working in a firm environment you know, is that, you know, in that environment, it's understood that, you know, people have a need and an obligation to remain current in their area of practice. And so I'm really lucky that I've got super resources in librarians, knowledge management Mm. people, you know, who who keep track of that stuff. Yeah. And I, and they, they say to me, okay, what do you need to know? Okay. I need to know about these topics and I'd like to send, you know, media reports on these things, you know, so I can keep track of what's going on and they do it for me. You know, I'm, but if you're not fortunate enough to have someone to do that for you, then you have to, I think, apply some thought to the kinds of things that are likely going to affect you and find some way to keep track of that. Social media helps a lot, Yep. right? Like you can remain topical on what is happening right now if you're on that platform, on platform like that. Um, You know, I got, I remember getting uh, good advice from, uh, Uh, someone who had provided some business development instruction to our past firm. And what he said was read the business section every day, Mm. every day at the time we were still reading newspapers, but you know, like check that out. What's, what's being reported as being topical. What's, what's evolved, what's what's changing. Yeah. Yeah. So that can give you some clues about the kinds of things maybe you should delve into a little bit more deeply. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, in terms of legal developments, you know, there are lots of sources online now that can provide you with some summaries of recent decisions or uh, interpretations or, you know, commentary from academics on where those decisions are going or what these things mean. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can find a lot more of that stuff in media that's not printed anymore. So you can you can do some of this stuff yourself. It's always harder, though. Yeah. Um, What's. I want to ask you this because <laughs> I've always wondered how a lawyer chooses, you know, where they, not where they, the practice group they're in, but more so how do you decide I want to stay in pri- private practice or I want to go internal mm. or I want to do some other thing. I want to start mm. my own own practice. I guess the question would be more towards private practice versus working internal mm-hmm. as a general counsel at a, at a, at a large company. Mm-hmm. How do you make that decision or what, what would attract you to either one? Uh, well, there are a few things that might attract you to either one. You know, one relates to a question you've already asked me, which is how you manage all those things in private practice. Mm-hmm. You know, when I talked about how you have all these things you have to balance when you're in private practice. You know, so some people get to a stage in private practice where they just go, I, this balance is not working for me. 
Right. It's not achieving what I thought it was going to, so I want to do something other than private practice. You know, sometimes that is an in-house role that they want to do. Um, some people who choose to go in-house always knew they wanted to be business people. Oh, okay. You yep. know, they're entrepreneurs. Or um, they really value being part of the team that's making the business decisions. And that is as important to them as giving the legal advice. Right. Right. You know, so that's that's really what they want to achieve in mm. their career. So, you know, they may come to a realization that now is the time or maybe that's what they always plan to do. Yeah. Um, you know, some people make other decisions about what they want to do with their careers, you know, that can include, as I said, finance. Some people go into politics. Mm hmm. You know, some people end up on the bench. There's all kinds of things you can do other than private practice if that's what you decide. Yeah. How does how does that work in terms of getting elevated to the bench? Is that the right word? Or appointed. Appointed, we'll say appointed. Yeah. appointed to the bench? Yeah. And how does how does that get determined? So there's a whole process that you have to go okay. through. You need to have a certain level of of seniority again. Yeah. Um so you know, people who are newly called to the bar and who are having trouble with that balance, they're not yet eligible to mm -hmm. be appointed to the bench. But if you've been in pra practice for a while, you've demonstrated some expertise, you know, you, you're you recognized as a thought leader or uh, someone who's an expert, there's an application process that you complete in order to fulfill that. And then that goes to people who make those decisions and, right. and perhaps an appointment is made. Right. Interesting pathways in the legal profession. Truly. Yeah. It's not just as, you know, straightforward as what we watch on Netflix. Exactly. <laughs> like suits. As, exactly. Remember, I wanted to be a litigator. It looks nothing like that. I, actually, that's one question I had. So Heather Barnhouse, who yeah. you're your former yeah. colleague, um, I asked her the same question. I'm like, is it is it like suits? And she's like, no. Not <laughs> <So> at all. <laughs> not at all. Nothing like TV. No. And uh, no, I, no, I would not be suited to be a litigator. So it's all worked out the way it's supposed to. Um, before we end our episode, and I've been doing this with all our guests, mm -hmm. so I haven't prepared you for this. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear the raw raw answer from you. Okay. But the reason why we named our company Convos is because we really feel that conversations is what it's it's the component that makes things better. It 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 uh, client relations are better through yeah. better communications and having com genuine authentic conversations. Yeah. So a question I have for all my guests, mm -hmm. if you had an opportunity uh, to have a conversation with someone dead or alive, mm -hmm. who would it be? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, Hillary Clinton. Okay. Hillary Why? Clinton. <clears throat> I have always admired Hillary Clinton as someone who came from a background that perhaps didn't necessarily point her in the direction of law. Mm -hmm. And I've always watched her and thought of her as someone who really understood what was going on in the environment that she was in, regardless of what you think of her politics. Right. Um, you know, she, she really um, had a really thorough knowledge of things and obviously had a, a, a direction that she wanted to take things. But I've admired her as someone who was... Uh, a strong woman who chose a path in law, who's made some unconventional or has had some unconventional roles that have been unbelievably high profile, yep. high responsibility, um, high impact. And, you know, that's someone that I would really like to speak to. Um, interesting. You said her name because uh, so my aunt in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, she's retired now, but she used to work for the Hong Kong government yep. and uh, she worked her way up in uh, became like head of, I think it's like the official thing. It's like head of organization for like big events that come yeah. into Hong Kong. Yeah. And so a lot of events often circled around politicians. Yeah. And so when Bill Clinton was president at that yeah. time, yeah. Um, they had a big convention conference in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And my aunt was in charge of keeping Hillary and Chelsea um, entertained <laughs> and really? created a whole program for them yeah for that so when i i remember our whole family was all excited we were like oh you got to meet the first lady and the daughter yeah yeah what's one question what would be your first question you'd ask hillary clinton um well i'd ask her a lot of the questions you've asked me <laughs> okay you know like did you always see this is the mm. like we know some of this because it's in the public yeah realm but you know did you always see yourself doing what you did like what was the decision tree for you what was the turning point for you right you know what if you went back and you could do it again what would you do again mm. 
you know, now that you're here this stage, you're senior, senior person with wealth of experience. What's the most important thing that, that got you here? Who were the most important supporters? You know, the kind of things yeah. you've been asking me. Thank you for listening to this episode of This Professional Life. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button or hit the follow button on whatever podcast platform you're listening to. Make sure to leave your comments below and share some of your career stories or let me know what other professionals you would like me to learn more about in a future podcast. Take care and we'll catch you in the next episode.